Okay. Thanks, Dr. Lee. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming today. Uh, so again, the topic of discussion today is specifically carcinoma in situ of the bladder, which is a unique clinical entity, and as well as fusing that with immunotherapy for uh, bladder cancer, which we all know is, is really a research highlight in urology over the past uh, few years and will be for the next couple of years as well. So just in brief, why are we here? You know, if you're, uh, these uh, topics that you're on rounds have been discussed in, in, in length, specifically immunotherapy for ca cancer in general, immunotherapy for urologic diseases, and immunotherapy specifically, specifically for bladder cancer. And, uh, and I'll give a shout out to our Grand Rounds website where we've had sh previous fellows like Shu Akamatsu that gave a great talk on immunotherapy. And if, in fact, PDL1 was apparently the protein was discovered by his original PI in Kyoto. Uh, so we had a connection there, and uh, then we had further talks on this with Dr. Black, and as well as uh, Ben Bay highlighted the Poles paper, which is here, which showed such uh, impressive results in the uh, chemorefractory muscle invasive metastatic bladder cancer state. And so a lot of papers are coming out now, predominantly this new NEJM paper, which showed a good effect for pembrolizumab, an anti-PD-1 antibody for, again, that same state of chemorefractory uh, metastatic bladder CA. But there are additionally more and more studies that are coming out investigating the role of immunotherapy in uh, non-invasive bladder cancer. And within that realm, I wanted to focus specifically on carcinoma in situ, which is a you know, unique uh, uh, clinical entity, I think, compared to other uh, intraepithelial neoplasias from other uh, organ types. So the objectives today, uh, there's a, it's a little bit of a mix of this, and so it doesn't follow these rigid guidelines directly, but to review the basic pathophysiology of carcinoma in situ of the bladder and review the role of BCG, which was the first immunotherapy described uh, in, in urology and is still used as standard of care today, then describe the immunogenicity specifically of CIS and what makes CIS a good candidate for immunotherapy, especially in the era we are now with many new potential uh, Immuno targets being identified, and then the role of combination BCG and PDL1 in some studies I had the opportunity to participate in uh, with uh, Dr. Black's lab. So, very basic from Campbell's pathophysiology of CIS, we all know this high grade, flat lesion, no invasion, but stress that it is high grade by definition. It is generally considered to be the precursor of invasive disease, T2 disease. Uh, and histologically, it's characterized by the lack of the uh, regular cellular architecture of the urothelium with highly dysplastic cells, but again, that are not uh, invading. Patients can present with symptoms that uh, uh, can be irritative LUTs, hematuria, or simply asymptomatic. And CIS and non-muscle invasive bladder cancer in general uh, have a high associated cost with them because of treatments, surveillance cystoscopies, and finally, the treatments associated with failure of intravesical treatments, which in this case, CIS, is uh, cystectomy, other than trial options, which we will just touch on. So there's a lot of molecular profiling of, of bladder cancer that's been published by TCGA and other groups. This is uh, an earlier paper from 2004, which looked at gene expression signatures uh, of carcinoma in situ. And there's other tables, but what this heat map suggested is that among cystectomy specimens that were done for CIS, the actual histologic CIS and the histologic normal bladder adjacent to the CIS had very similar signatures. Whereas if you took a sample of superficial TCC that lacked any CIS, it had a completely different signature than a TCC with background CIS, which suggests that two things. One, that there is a field effect, which we acknowledge because of chronic smoking, chronic carcinogen exposure in the bladder. Um, and second, that the bladder cancers might be classified into different entities based on the presence of, of CIS. And this has been borne out in, in further genomic studies uh, that have been more recent. Management options, as we mentioned, are lacking for CIS. BCG is the standard of care uh, for all the guidelines with some nuance in terms of induction and maintenance schedules. But despite appropriate BCG therapy, which is induction and, and maintenance course, CIS certainly can recur in up to 40% of patients. And the majority of these will then fail a repeat BCG injection. And, uh, and so what are the salvage options post this? We've had grand rounds on this topic as well, so I didn't want to get into it too much, but certainly 
once the patient has failed BCG, there's many other intravesical options that, that can be done. There, there are FDA approval for different chemotherapies after BCG, more BCG or combination of different agents. And uh, part of that uh, interest is these novel therapies, predominantly checkpoint inhibitors, which might be able to uh, augment the effect of other therapies on CIS and delay or prolong that time to failure and eventual cystectomy. So BCG is the standard of care for, uh, for CIS of the bladder. And so what is BCG? It's the live attenuated form of uh, Mycobacterium bovis. And it was originally uh, an organism that was used to model treatments for tuberculosis in the early 1900s. It's been subcultured to a non-virulent strain quite a, a while ago, uh, which permitted human trials quite early on. And there were a lot of reports of patients that had TB that had lower rates of malignancies or lower grades of malignancies in the early 1900s and 1950s. And uh, that also prompted interest in using it as a, as a vaccine against not only TB, but against cancer in general. And a lot of early papers from 73, 73, 76, uh, were using BCG in the same cohort of cancers that immunotherapy with checkpoint inhibitors are used now, predominantly melanoma, there's no lung on here, uh, but kidney as well. And the thought was that, that the BCG particle, the, the attenuated um, bacterium, has to be in direct contact with the malignant cell population. And that's why it was amenable to things like melanoma, head and neck cancers, uh, kidney, not so much, at least in the 70s, but obviously bladder as well, with the possibility to instill it within the bladder. So this is the, the famous 1976 paper from Morales with nine patients treated with superficial TCC, uh, all TA or TIS high grade. And they, uh, back, in, uh, back in the day here, used combination uh, intradermal BCG injection with intravesical uh, Q weekly, times six weeks as their induction and they determined their outcomes just via the results of the initial biopsy, not long-term follow-up here, but it was remarkable because all these patients with you know, high-grade uh, superficial TCC, or recurring TCC at least, responded to this BCG therapy uh, with a lot of uh, repeat biopsies just shows, showing focal inflammation, focal granulomatous changes, or no evidence of, of malignancy. And so this was remarkable. Um, last month, the AUA published some centenary supplement, which highlighted a few of the major impact-making papers over the past hundred years in urology, and this was one of them. And this was followed up by another paper, which was also part of that same centennial supplement, which was the, uh, the phase uh, three trial on the use of BCG maintenance versus induction for a high-grade uh, TA, T1, and carcinoma in situ. Uh, so they uh, stratified their patients, which we don't anymore, but based on the patient's reaction to the, um, the MAN2 test, also stratified based on the presence of CIS, knowing that it's particularly sensitive to, to BCG. And their group used a maintenance schedule, which you, you see here, uh, and did not use the intradermal injection. It was just uh, intravesical treatment. But again, maintenance therapy was associated with improved recurrence-free survival, progression-free survival, uh, and overall survival I don't think was uh, significant, but there was a, a trend for it. If you look specifically at this paper within the CIS group, so patients that had pure CIS, no uh, papillary disease or T1 disease, uh, they were able to get about 117, 116 into the maintenance arm and the no maintenance arm. And this highlighted a few key points, which are in all, in all the guidelines now. Uh, and the major thing is that maintenance increases your uh, res complete response to, uh, to BCG therapy. 84% complete response uh, at six months with uh, just one or maybe one or two uh, episodes of maintenance BCG. But even in the patients that received no maintenance, there was an increase in complete response rates at six months, even though they were only given that induction phase. And so it suggested that maintenance is important to give, but also to determine the full effect of BCG after an induction course, you have to wait at least six months, because there are patients with disease at three months that will respond uh, about 10% that will additionally have a complete response without any more uh, BCG. Uh, there's been some consensus papers that have tried to reconcile uh, some of the difference between all the different authorities here, uh, recognizing that all these different uh, uh, groups are, uh, have slightly different um, methods of administering BCG in their induction and maintenance schedule, and it's usually with the duration of maintenance, one, 
to one to three years is usually recommended and how to schedule that maintenance therapy. But the, the important take home message from that is without doubt maintenance therapy is, is important and should be considered standard of care when treating BCG, not just uh, induction courses. And the Kaplan-Meier curves suggest that the maintenance BCG works for the TA and T1 high-grade disease and also for pure CIS, although pure CIS does worse than just the TA or T1, because as we know, CIS is high, high, uh, very high-grade disease and a precursor to invasive lesions. On a population-based level, uh, they've tried to study this as well. So this is now retrospectively looking at SEER database with a very high number of patients. And again, these papers highlight two common themes. Uh, one is that BCG does work for high-grade bladder cancer. There was no difference in overall survival uh, in, uh, in patients with low-grade disease uh, offered BCG, but the difference can be stark. So these uh, graphs are just increasing grade of, of TCC. Um, and so there's no benefit for BCG in low-grade, and that's why chemotherapy postoperatively is used and obviously not, not BCG. But this population data also suggests that BCG is very underutilized and only 22% of patients in this study that were considered eligible actually received uh, an induction course of BCG, n not even considering a maintenance course. So our CUA guidelines uh, obviously suggest BCG. Uh, and amongst the whole guidelines, it's very interesting, there's very few grade A recommendations. Uh, and the main ones we know are to, do a, to perform a complete initial TUR and perform your re-resection of six weeks with grade A evidence. And I think the only other thing in, in the guidelines with grade A evidence is BCG for high-grade disease. And so it should be uh, offered uh, to everyone. And obviously there have been issues with shortages and all that, which have prompted other modalities of managing uh, intravesical high-grade, uh, intravesically managing high-grade bladder cancer. But certainly uh, BCG should be the standard of care. There's a classic list that I think comes up on our exams and some Royal College lists of, you know, what are the, the factors for progression in, in bladder cancer. And it's important to note that this in this EORTC pooled analysis, you know, from patients that were accrued from studies uh, quite a ways back, but CIS alone was the highest predictor of progression amongst the other factors, which were number of tumors, tumor size, uh, prior recurrence, T category, and, and grade. And so CIS certainly is the, the major driver of progression and, and doesn't bode well for patients that have, have it, obviously. Uh, in this cohort, though, BCG was certainly underutilized. And there was no maintenance BCG when it was used. And so maybe that uh, the weight on CIS might be less if it was appropriately treated. But nonetheless, it's clear that uh, CIS is certainly a driver of, of progressive disease. And uh, so we touched on this before from that 2004 paper uh, that was looking at the genomics of superficial TCCs, and uh, a lot of papers have come out on this, and Dr. Black, I think, is key in this, in this area with his work with Dr. McConkie, I believe. And it's the idea that there, there are t multiple pathways that can generate bladder cancer. And so the, the image in Campbell's, which is the inset here, and this is even in Campbell's 11, it, it almost suggests that there's a, a single linear path where CIS might be the precursor to uh, you know, all these different types of invasive disease. But on a genomic level, it's clear that there are different pathways that uh, the, the urothelium can undergo. And one leads to, it's classically defined by mutations in the FGFR3 uh, uh, receptor, which drives these papillary recurrent TA, possibly, well, TA lesions that are more prone to recurrence and are termed genomically stable uh, based on, on genomic and chromosomal uh, studies. Whereas the second pathway is the genomically unstable pathway, which, uh, which leads to CIS, which is then a, a precursor to invasive disease. And these are marked by uh, pa mutations in P53 and RB, many cell cycle uh, genes. And they're also genomically unstable with many chromosome breakages, uh, aneuploidy, and other things that, again, suggest that they might be more amenable to immunotherapy because they're so unstable and should be recognized by the immune system as non-self. The That idea of this, this dual tractor, the, these multiple pathways that can lead to invasive disease uh, has been borne out in other studies. This is an earlier one, once again, 
uh, classifying a TCC based only on chromosomal uh, aber aberrations, not on sequencing or, or anything like that. And they again suggest that there are uh, clear pathways, one that drives a papillary phenotype driven by the FGFR3 receptor mutations and the CIS type. And there can be crossover between these, those superficial recurrent lesions can certainly become invasive. Uh, but there seems to be two distinct pathways, and we can touch on this in a couple of more slides. There's already been a comprehensive characterization of muscle invasive bladder cancer, and then and more recently, uh, transcriptional analysis of superficial early stage uh, carcinoma was uh, published. And this suggested, once again, that there is a CIS uh, signature, and that CIS enriches in what they call here class two, which is the poor prognosis class. And so if you look at the CIS signature here, this green is positive. It's highly enriched in this class two, some in class three, and almost uh, very few in the class one type tumors. Uh, and the class two tumors were associated with uh, worse prognosis higher recurrence and higher risk of progression. And so once again, they're, uh, based on their uh, genomic analysis, their schematic is that there's this divergent pathways of, of neoplastic transformation, the TA pathway and the CIS pathway, and there certainly can be a class shift from that the TA pathway to a muscle invasive pathway based on the type of uh, aberrations within the cell. Notably, those class two lesions had few FGFR3 mutations, and as we mentioned, more mutations in the cell signaling, uh, cell um, cycle uh, proteins. And finally, the, the class two proteins also had quite a few aberrations in, in other hallmarks of cancer that are known to be uh, associated with high-grade metastatic disease, and those are uh, classic attributes like epithelial to mesenchymal transition, transformation, um, cancer stem cell activity, and, uh, and different types of mutations. So as we said, this CIS then is coming from a genomically unstable type cell, which technically should be recognized and, and removed by a competent um, immune system of the host. And that, that's been described in length in what's called the cancer immunity cycle. And again, for bladder cancer, this is getting a lot more interest because it, it does uh, identify a lot of targets that can be treated therapeutically, uh, intravesically, and systemically. And so the cancer immunity cycle very briefly suggests that there's three phases uh, of, of the cycle, essentially elimination of malignant transformed cells by the immune system, an equilibrium achieved when maybe the burden of malignant cells uh, is equal to the body's ability to identify and destroy them, and finally an escape of, this immune, uh, of the uh, malignantly transformed cell via various mechanisms, either over burdening the immune system of the host or generally what's considered to be called escape. Uh, where the tumor microenvironment can actually uh, calm down and prevent appropriate um, destruction of the tumor by the immune cells, even if the immune system is primed against the, the, the tumor. And this is really where the role of checkpoint inhibitors have, um, have received a lot of highlight in neurology as they work in the periphery to re release the breaks off of T cells that should be recognizing uh, a cancer. There's an issues of science and nature that have been dedicated directly to, to this topic, specifically focusing on that principle that these genomically unstable cells should be producing a lot of cancer neoantigens, which might serve as potential uh, targets for therapy by allowing the immune system to adequately recognize this. And the classic example of this is the PD-1, PD-L1 uh, axis. And so briefly, we expect that the uh, tumor cell should be recognized by, uh, uh, in this case, a CDA positive T cell, which is primed against some aberrant protein that that, pro that, that cancer is making. Uh, but when it arrives to the tumor microenvironment targeted for destruction, that tumor cell itself is able to direct that T cell to, to, rent, to turn into a quiescent state, where it is technically primed against the, the tumor antigen, but unable to mount effector T cell function. And that's really because of the, the requirement for co-stimulation in these T-cell interactions. So despite an antigen-presenting cell or a T-cell showing an appropriate uh, epitope or peptide to uh, the T-cell, the co-stimulatory uh, 
protein in this case is not stimulatory. In fact, it's a repressive, it's a suppressive signal, and that T cell relies dormant in the tumor microenvironment. And we see these on biopsies of TCC with uh, T cell infiltration within within the microenvironment, but no effector function when you look at the the uh, when you look at T effector function, like some people look at granzymes and other things like that. And so CTLA4 and PD1 are the two well described targets, and they're FDA approved, especially in melanoma, where a lot of this research comes from. Uh, but there's obviously a whole host of other targets that can affect that cycle. And bladder cancer seems to be primed for this because we know that on the spectrum of malignancies, bladder cancer is more towards the end of uh, high mutation bearing tumors. And you see here the other, the other ones at the most right with the most mutations and therefore the most cancer associated antigens should be lung and melanoma, cancers that are caused by chronic carcinogen exposure, be it smoking or, or UV light. And bladder <coughs> cancer is up there. And we've seen it clinically with the success of checkpoint inhibitors. This has been a topic in all cancers of late, but the ability of, of uh, the cancers to repair these DNA mutations or to identify uh, aberrant replication processes and correct them to maintain a, a proper genome has also been studied both in, in bladder cancer cell lines and in patient samples, and it suggests what we're seeing already clinically, and that is that the, the cells with the lowest ability to repair the genome, here mismatch repair, uh, are in cell lines with the most um, aggressive potential and in bladder cancer samples that we know are, are associated with the most aggressive potential, predominantly T1 high grade and CIS. So that cancer immunity cycle again comes up with that immunosuppressive milieu being uh, created by uh, the expression of these checkpoint inhibitors and therefore we know we can target them. CTLA4 is targetable within the lymph node of the, of the uh, organism whereas PDL1 is targetable within the actual tumor itself. And so we have multiple targets coming up here. And they're all, they're, they're all to disturb the normal cycling of the T cell uh, and to allow it to get into the tumor, recognize the tumor, and actually destroy the tumor. And so the targets here are plenty. And this is all what's coming down the pipeline. It's, it's, it can be confusing to try to sort through the papers on immunotherapy because there's just so many targets that have been presented and therefore studying them does represent a challenge, um, especially in developing clinical trials. Now, BCG is the first immunotherapy we mentioned that's been used successfully in bladder cancer and used to this day, but its mechanism is actually unclear. It's very well recognized that BCG requires a full immune system, and essentially, if you knock out any cohort of the immune system, like lymphocytes, neutrophils, uh, natural killer cells, or certain cytokines, the effect of BCG in animal models is lost. Uh, and there's even evidence suggesting a role for the urothelial cells themselves in mounting that local immune response uh, in, in the bladder. Now this is a, a popular figure um, and the current concept of how BCG is presumed to work. Uh, an important point here is that uh, it's very clear that BCG attaches to the urothelial cells via fibronectin and knock out a fibronectin uh, or certain integrins uh, almost uh, removes all BCG efficacy in animal models. But there's a whole host of other players here, law, huge pathways that are required to, to BC, for BCG to mount that immune response in the bladder that eventually results in the killing of cancer cells. And this has to be thought of not only as an instantaneous effect, but also a long-term effect, because as we saw in those trials, the effect of BCG, even up to six months following induction, you can still see uh, complete responses. So this is something that's ongoing within the bladder despite uh, a single course of induction. There's been some research showing that the ability of these uh, TCC cells to uh, present antigen on their surface can also uh, dictate response uh, to, to BCG with cells that were very low um, in producing HLA class 1 to present antigen to the immune system uh, seem to respond poorer to uh, than cells that were abundant in neoantigen presentation. Although in this study, they only looked at recurrence and not progression. And as we know, CIS is marked by progression not, and less so recurrence. 
when BCG doesn't work, the, there's been that uh, term called BCG failure, and there's been a lot of nuance in this in terms of how to act, how to subdivide this in terms of what's actually been going on, because uh, many, many failures are caused by that third point there, which is simply BCG intolerance, where patients don't get a chance to uh, obtain the full uh, course of treatment because uh, uh, because they're intolerant or they have local symptoms and so these should ideally not be termed pure failures because these patients might uh, benefit from further BCG but otherwise these terms which are which you know are less and less used now but uh, have been used before in certain trial designs are BCG relapse where there's a period a tumor free period on cystoscopy and biopsy with a recurrence happening at some time point and BCG refractory which is um, the six-month uh, cystobiopsy showing either persistent disease or even progression of disease. Uh, there's been also been the term BCG unresponsive, which uh, we'll mention here, uh, which has been discussed as well, uh, and kind of catches all those terms except BCG intolerance, and that is high-grade disease, persistence of high-grade disease or recurrence within six months, and having received uh, at least two courses of BCG that is at least uh, the majority of an induction phase and at least the majority of uh, or early maintenance. And the exception for this, again, we're talking only about CIS, but the exception is high-grade T1, where persistence of disease following induction alone is sufficient to, to call for progression, and there's no need to offer a, a maintenance in that situation because we know those patients do poorly. But for CIS specifically, the definition of failure should include uh, patients that have had some maintenance therapy. And this, these have been borne out in other studies showing that patients that are truly refractory to BCG progress uh, and that stands to reason. Whereas those that were intolerant tend not to progress because they might be candidates for further BCG if they can tolerate it. So the options post-BCG uh, could be a talk in, in and of itself. We've uh, had some uh, grand rounds that have discussed that, so I just want to mention in, in brief that when intravesical BCG fails, there are other alternatives prior to cystectomy and those that refuse cystectomy or, or are ineligible for cystectomy. And essentially the options are you know, more immunotherapy, novel immunotherapy, chemotherapy, and these new device-assisted therapies like chemohypothermia or EMDA to, to promote uh, uh, or to augment the effect of chemotherapy within the bladder. But certainly these failures, uh, and there are a lot of failures in this space, which is mostly trial space, the treatment, uh, preferred treatment option for BCG failure would eventually be a cystectomy. And therefore that space to identify new targets that can delay or prevent cystectomy is, is very important. And then uh, finally, just touching on uh, PDL1 and BCG and uh, the rationale for combination therapy. Uh, there's, this is a paper that gets cited often in, in this literature, uh, and uh, it was staining of tissues of all different grades of, of TCC4, PDL1, and they showed that CIS had the highest staining uh, for PDL1, specifically patients that had failed uh, BCG and either had recurrent disease or progressive disease. Uh, and in this paper, they stained just any uh, PDL1 uh, on the slide, and not specifically tumor cells only. But they showed that these granuloma, which are induced by BCG, stain very strongly for PDL1. And they suggested that in patients that progressed uh, high staining of PDL1, high expression of this checkpoint might be a reason for BCG failure, and therefore uh, providing. Uh, uh, inhibition of the checkpoint can actually augment that effect of the immune system to target bladder cancer. And so I, I looked at this in, in the lab in brief with, with Dr. Black, uh, and there, it was a multi-tiered project looking at some in vitro data, in vivo data, and then clinical data with patient samples. And so the in vitro data was profiling pdl one expression in a, in a panel of bladder cell lines, uh, and the in vivo data was modeling the combination of BC, intravesical BCG with systemic PDL1 given concurrently in a mouse model of bladder cancer. And then uh, finally we assembled a cohort of CIS tissue pre and post BCG in patients that had BCG refractory uh, um, uh, CIS. And uh, we we're looking for PDL1 expression and whether it changes like that Inman paper pre and post uh, BCG.
So the, most of the results are, are uh, being accrued now, but I thought I'd just share what we have and maybe uh, if there are any suggestions for modeling this in, uh, going forward, it'd be great to hear. But T24, which is one of those cell lines we heard of before that had the worst mismatch repair ability, also seems to be this, uh, the bladder cancer cell line with that most EMT-like phenotype where it's lost a lot of epithelial markers with a higher expression of, uh, of these mesenchymal markers, predominantly ZEB1, Vimentin. And when we did flow cytometry in the lab uh, for PDL1, as which is a surface uh, uh, on the marker on these cells, it appeared that the PDL1 expression fit in line with the EMT status of these cell lines, with T24 having uh, log fold higher PDL1 expression versus uh, a classically epithelial line. In the, in the mouse model, uh, we provided BBN, which is a carcinogen similar to that found in cigarette smoke. Uh, we pr provided that uh, in the drinking water of a cohort of uh, immune competent mice to induce CIS and bladder cancer and uh, serially sacrificed the mice to see what was going on in their bladder over a period of weeks. And we saw that by 16 weeks there was evidence of dysplasia. Unfortunately, in our, in our model, this was followed by a rapid progression to invasive carcinoma, so this cohort didn't reflect pure CIS, but certainly the, the treatment of, uh, with anti pdl one systemically and intravesical BCG in this cohort did uh, reduce, did improve survival in the mice and reduce the bladder weights, and at the moment we have a TMA of uh, their uh, bladder tissues as well as serum collected at the time of harvest, which can be used for immune profiling uh, from this cohort. And then finally, in this BCG uh, unresponsive uh, cohort of patient samples, we uh, took the paraffin embedded tissue and um, took slides to stain for CIS, and as well took cores, which were uh, which hopefully can be sampled for RNA sequencing uh, for, to, to identify changes that occur on a cellular level in patients that fail uh, BCG. This staining was performed with a, a particular antibody of PDL1 which uh, has some controversy uh, with it, but certainly it was performed by one of the major centers uh, in PDL1 staining in Seattle, and uh, we look forward to, to getting these results. But initial results showed very poor staining of the tumor cells themselves, not of the entire uh, 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 cell slide, which is consisting of granuloma, tumor cells, stroma, and obviously the infiltrating immune cells, which will all which will score separately. But certainly the tumor cells themselves, there appeared to be very little staining uh, in the pre and post BCG uh, cohorts. And, uh, and so th this is where bladder cancer is at the moment. There's been a lot of uh, summary meetings and consensus meetings over the past few years to highlight uh, how to best design these trials to investigate these new uh, therapies that are coming down the line. And, uh, these keynote trials and other trials which we'll be reporting in the next few years, next few months to years, uh, are going to suggest a lot more uh, novel intravesical treatments, especially in the setting of BCG unresponsive disease. And so it was interesting to, to get uh, some uh, work in this space. And uh, that's it. Thanks very much.